Uh, hi, everyone. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Amelia Kelly. Um, I'm the director of speech recognition for Soapbox Labs, and I've never worn one of these headsets before, so I feel really funny. But uh, it's great to be here. Thanks to Declan for organizing, and thanks to Anna for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, just about generally what I do in my job, which is uh, children's speech recognition. Uh, the company Soapbox Labs, uh, we're a small company, and we have been going for about two or three years now. And we make uh, high-accuracy high children's speech recognition. So the idea is, is that uh, developers, big companies, um, whoever wants to use our technology can just sign up, use our API, and use, put their speech rec recognition in their apps and services to make them voice controllable by children. So um, I was talking recently at Futurescope, and I, I used some of the same slides. But uh, one of the things I, I brought up there, and I'll say again here, is that uh, speech recognition is um, getting popular again. It's getting cool again. Uh, everyone's talking about it. At the Consumer Electronics Show this year, um, they called 2017 the year of voice. And they talked about how uh, in the last 30 months, we've made more advances in speech recognition than we have done in the last 30 years. Now, a lot of the technology that is allowing this to happen, and that's deep neural nets, um, a lot of this kind of um, theory has been around for a long time. But it's only recently that we're actually able to get any good results for speech recognition using these theories because of advances in computer programming or computer power, processing power, and uh, all that kind of thing. So now um, we are going through one of these periods where everybody loves speech recognition again. Um, I know about five years ago, Siri came out and everybody was using it on their phones for like five minutes, and then they all stopped because nobody wants to walk down the road saying, hey, Siri, what's going on? Because they feel like an idiot. But now people are using home assistants. And 2017 has seen kind of the rise of the home assistant, like Amazon Echo. Uh, Google Home, uh, Homer, and Ollie. Uh, these are all examples of speech recognition systems that people have in their homes. And they are perfectly comfortable talking to them in their homes because nobody's there to listen to them talk to their phone. So um, they, uh, as well as this, they're working really well because of advances in speech recognition. So Google have published some results recently where uh, on their test set, currently they're getting a 4.9 percent word error rate. Um, this is meaningless on its own because we don't know what their test set was. But we can see that in July 2016, they were at 8.5. In October, 6.8. In December, 6.1. And now they're down to 4.9. So you can see that it's a trend. You can see that it's getting better. And I think this is all down to uh, using deep neural nets to do their speech recognition. Um, as I said, in isolation, it's hard to know how Google are doing in comparison to other companies because Google don't publish their test set, as far as I know. Um, so we do have these similar results coming in from um, IBM and Microsoft, um, except these are actually comparable to each other because they're all done on the switchboard database, which is a large database that everybody uses as a kind of a benchmark to uh, show how well their speech recognition systems are doing. So. Um, IBM Watson published a 5.5% word error rate recently on the switchboard database. Uh, Microsoft uh, published a 6.3%, although you know they could have published something even more recently that was even lower. Um, the point is here is that now this is newsworthy. People are publishing these results, and everyone's talking about it. I see a different result like this in the paper every couple of weeks. Um, also, IBM Watson, when they published their 5.5% um, word error rate um, result, they also said that um, they had done some kind of uh, human test as well, where they got humans to listen to the test set and transcribe exactly what they heard. And the humans' word error rate result was like 5.9% or something. So IBM's big announcement was that they can do recognition better than humans can. So um, all this has contributed to, as I said, the rise of the home assistant. It's what's making speech recognition actually work properly. And uh, the problem with this, of where I come in, where Soapbox Labs comes in, is that there are still very bad speech recognition results for children's speech. So whatever we're seeing here is all for adult speech. 
Um, for children's speech, the, it's been reported that the word error rate is like up to 100%, 200%. I've even seen a figure saying it was 400% uh, higher word error rates for children's speech than for adult speech. Um, now, there's no switchboard database for children, as far as I know, but there is a database called PF Star, um, which uh, was recorded back in the early 2000s as part of um, the FP5 funding scheme, I think, and the EU thing. And they recorded German children, Swedish children uh, speaking English, I think, with accented English, and also uh, British children speaking English. So I'm just focusing on the British English part. So you've got um, about 7.5 hours, 7 hours worth of data from Britain, one country, and about 159 speakers all children between the ages of like four and 14. And uh, the type of uh, data, I actually have some I can play you here, but I'm not sure if it's gonna work because I can't see my mouse. So, um, hang on. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. No, sorry, can't play it for you. Anyway, um, my colleague Nick suggested that if this happened, I could just put on a kid's voice and pretend that I was doing it, but uh, I don't think that's going to work. Um, so the point I was going to get across by uh, playing the audio was that you can hear the child speaking um, sentences like, uh, put on the hat, or these are my shoes, the elephant is in the zoo, things like that. Um, it was uh, young children, and they're reading, and they're quite confident, and um, it's all very clean speech. And there's no background noise, and it's just perfectly recorded. Then there are some other um, samples in it of some of the younger children. And um, first of all, the, the reading mightn't be great, so they need somebody to prompt for them. So you can actually hear the researcher in the background saying, say book now, John, John, say book. And you can also hear her say, take your hand out of your mouth. So <laughs> like you can understand why there might not be such big databases of children's speech to work with, so people can't really test on them, train on them, publish their results on them. So um, the same team who did the recording of the database in Birmingham, uh, Martin Russell and Shona Darcy uh, were two of the researchers, uh, they did another paper where they tested the word error rate results on it. Now, they were building uh, HMM-based uh, models, and they got 45% uh, word error rate across all age groups. But they actually broke it down per age group as well and found that the younger the child, the more difficult it was to actually get good recognition results. Um, last year in CSTR in Edinburgh, they uh, did a similar experiment and they managed using CALDI. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with speech recognition tools, but uh, CALDI is kind of the industry, industry standard now. It's taken over from HTK and people are using it a lot. And uh, it's very good and it has uh, capabilities of doing, um, using deep neural nets. Um, in CSTR, using HMM and GMM um, models, they got a word error rate of like 30 or 31 percent. Uh, using DNNs, they only actually got down to 29 percent. So this is interesting because, um, you know, when I was thinking of what I'd say tonight, I was going to have the story that DNNs came along and they saved the day and everything was great. But actually, with children's speech, that hasn't really been the case because uh, there's not enough data to work with in these uh, freely available data or freely issue available databases. So uh, for CSTR, um, they use, there's two packages in CALDI uh, that are uh, two kind of deep neural net frameworks. There's uh, NNet1 and NNet2. And um, they uh, differ in a variety of different ways. It's just kind of architecturally. Um, the uh, NNet2, uh, for example, allows you to um, use multiple uh, GPUs uh, at the same time in parallel. And I think it, it averages the um, parameters after every couple of minutes, and then it's not quite optimal. They have to use a different kind of um, a gradient thing. Then I can't really remember, but actually I've got some good references for that if anybody's interested in the details. Um, so using these two um, packages in Caldi, they couldn't actually even get a better word error rate than 29%. So, uh, what is the, uh, what, what, oh, hang on, sorry, my thing isn't working now. Oh, oh, oh hey, so, uh, yeah, just, just to break it down even further, um, when we're building the uh, acoustic models, you start off with a monophone model, then build a series of triphone models, um, and do various types of adaptation on that, 
And finally, you can feed that into the uh, neural net uh, framework in Caldi. And uh, you can see after every stage of the model build what the results were for Birmingham there on the top in CSTOR in red. And um, just again, you can see that the neural nets didn't provide any um, extra uh, any extra improvement in word error rate. Now, I think the reason for this is a uh, lack of data and also um, a lack of diversity in the data. So um, as I said, BF star, a lot of it is very clean. There's not much noise going on. Um, even if this was a benchmark, even if we could get really good results and all compare them, that would still just be an academic exercise because like in reality, um, what happens is that children aren't in clean rooms anymore and they aren't sitting down with their headsets and their microphones. And that's not how we need speech technology to work anymore because children are now speaking into smartphones and tablets and they're even using uh, VR headset devices. And this is how they are interacting with technology. And this is where speech recognition needs to go in order to understand them. Um, this is where DNNs will come in as well, because when you start getting databases of children interacting with technology like this, they're not just in a quiet room anymore either. They're in playgrounds and they're in classrooms, they're in cars, they're in kitchens, they've got TVs and radios on. And uh, this is where neural nets will really, really give you the edge, because you've got such a huge data, you can work with such huge databases with such big diversity. And actually, we've been doing a few tests in our own data. In uh, Soapbox Labs at the moment, we have um, a database where uh, it's actually pretty huge. These figures are actually slightly out of date. We now have uh, over 750,000 audio samples from more than 20,000 speakers in 135 different countries. Um, we have uh, various different types of speech. We have speech that's been prompted. We have speech that's being read. We have speech that is spontaneous and conversational. And it all goes into our database. And uh, in the normal way, we train our acoustic models, we train monophone models, triphone models, we do various types of adapt adaptation, but we also uh, have been experimenting with the different uh, neural net frameworks in Caldi, not only the two I just mentioned, but some of the new uh, ones, which uh, are the uh, long short term memory style things going on. And we're getting some really good results now. And I was hoping to end this talk by telling you some of them, but actually we haven't published them yet, so I'm not allowed. But uh, I'll let you know when we did when we do, but the result of what we're building is a product that is cloud-based and scalable, and it actually works in real-world conditions for kids using it in all the situations that I just showed you without headsets. So um, really, that's all I was going to say, just to give you an overview of where the technology is going and how we're using it in our company. Um, thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Oh, do I have to throw this thing? <laughs> okay, I'll throw it to you. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Is the database you, that you've built up, is that, um, that's not of kids? And yes. That can sort of, is it? It is. Well, it's all children's speech. Yeah. How did you manage to get up? Maybe Sorry? How did I manage? Oh, magic. <laughs> <laughs> A variety of different ways, but... Uh, yeah, it was very, very difficult. We're also actually probably going to publish on that as well. So. Yeah, and it's transcribed? Um, it is transcribed. Um, we had a lot of trouble doing that, but we have, we have our system now, and um, we have transcri transcribed not only the speech, but also the different noise events within the audio, so that's all very useful. Yeah. Yeah. I think your man was going to get out. When you think about children, maybe interacting with Amazon Alexa or something like that, how much of it will be about Amazon Alexa needing to be super smart and, and really discerning with, ch you know, with the children's speech? And how much of it will be about the children learning how to interact with Alexa effectively? Ah, well, <laughs> I suppose hopefully that will be a problem for Amazon Alexa and not for me. But uh, our uh, idea here really is that if we can provide high accuracy speech recognition for children's speech, then um, all the security things and all the things that Amazon Alexa will need to do in order to answer children's questions effectively or not answer children's questions um, will be the decision of Alexa. So if they detect children's speech, if the children's speech uh, is detected and it's a question that's within a particular area, they can choose what they do with that information. So uh, yeah, that's hopefully not up to us. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you for, for your talk as well. Um, I didn't catch um, what your use cases are for, for uh, kids. You alluded to um, voice assistance. Are you using it to um, assist children in some shape or form with uh, voice assisted devices or? Um, so there's a lot of um, applications that uh, our technology can be used for. Um, not only would it be like reading tutors in ed tech and the ed tech space, pronunciation tutors, even for English language learning. Um, so you could have a kind of a book reading thing where the child's pronunciation is rated. Um, so actually at Soapbox Labs, not only do we give back a transcription of the audio, but also uh, deep analysis, uh, linguistic analysis of what was said. So we can give back quality pronunciation scores and things like that. So all this information could be used by a developer who decides to make a reading or pronunciation app to um, get the kind of functionality they need. So let's say the quality score is above 70%, then the text would turn green as the child reads it. But we're really positioning ourselves in a space that uh, we don't make those decisions. So we just provide the analysis of the audio, of, of the children's speech audio. And the developer then would make decisions about what to do. So in gaming as well is another big area, big, big application area. So um, a lot of command and control style games. So like if you were, uh, the kid says to run or jump or fire or go left or right, they can interact with the game using their voice and then the information returned by our product could be used by the game developer to trigger an action like a, a picture reward or um, a character moving across a screen or something like that. So they're just two of the applications. Also like voice biometrics would be another one because we can provide information about the speaker as well. Thank you. Yeah. And how much of the, um, the speech recognition problems overlap with natural language processing? And technically speaking, when you do your training, do you train over the audio files or somehow you, tr you transform the audio, the audio to text and treat it as a uh, natural language processing problem? So uh, they are strongly uh, overlapping, I suppose, um, the NLP area and the acoustic modeling area. Uh, to be honest, you can't do speech recognition without both. So you can make a pure acoustic model where the decision of what somebody said is based uh, solely on the acoustic features. So we take an audio file, you split it into frames, you'd extract some features like MFCC features, and then you'd uh, use them to train a, a model. But also you need a language model as well, because you need to know what it's most likely that somebody said. So um, the language model that you use can drastically change the results that you get. Um, so if you restricted down your language model so it only said the word chicken, then every single audio file that came in, regardless of the acoustic model, would come out as chicken because that's all you allowed it to say. Uh, so if your test set entirely consisted of people saying chicken, then you'd be at a 0% word error rate and everything would be fine. But it wouldn't work in the real world, you know. So uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of um, NLP stuff goes on in, in this area as well. Um, the speech recognition is it depend on like suppose on the accent like uh, uh, your reference yes. database uh, contains different types of accent or only one accent? Um, it's a big problem actually. Well, it's not so much anymore with deep neural nets, but in the past it was a big problem that uh, you know in certain Ameri let's say American versus British accents, you say something one in way in America uh, like uh, yeah. head could be had in British English and that yeah. kind of thing. But um, the way we're approaching it is that um, the more data you have from various speakers, so we're going for pure diversity and then let the, let the DNN sort it out, basically. And that seems to work pretty well. Um, the, another approach is to actually have metadata about your audio so that you know that this group here is from you know, the British English group and this here is the American English. But it's much harder to do that now because regardless of where your data is collected, like uh, just because somebody lives in New York, it doesn't mean they'll have a New York yeah. accent. So uh, a lot of the time we think about maybe doing um, some kind of machine learning techniques like clustering to just be able to break them up into various groups like uh, which may or may not end up being labeled as British English or American English or, you know, any other type of of accent. So yeah, um, I think at the moment we're getting pretty good results by just letting the DNN sort it out. So with um, your test set contains all accents uh, of the, suppose chicken, chicken is a 
you can have different accent as well. Uh, yeah, so if you give the model enough, um, enough examples to learn from, it, um, you know, it's not like you're comparing this input audio file of someone saying chicken with this one file you have over here. You have a whole pile of examples of it, and it's learning from that. Okay. And if, you ha if that example has some peaks, so you've got your, you know, some people say it like that, some people say it like that, and the incoming file matches any of those, okay. then it will be, you know, the output will be chicken and it will be correct. So, so basically um, you are comparing with the, with the audio file only? Yeah. For the yeah, pretty much, yeah. Thank you. No worries. Hello, I want to ask a question about the voice sample. You, sure. You sure. You start talking about the gathering the sample from child. How do, um, I want to know how, <clears throat> what's the age between them? How many, how old are they um, in general? The children that we've collected the samples for, um, they're as young as two or three, although some of that data isn't very usable. Um, but the, of the usable data, I'd say from about four years old to 10. After 10 years old, um, adult speech APIs work better or work just as so well. So you, you think a teenager will be classified to adults? Or uh, not generally, yeah, the teenager's voice were, um, is recognized quite well by um, speech recognizers built on adult data. But, you know, I'm sure there's a, a niche in there as well for teenage Yeah, for voices. the language module, uh, is there any huge difference between ch young child or teenager or adults? And there's a huge difference between chil like young children's voices and any, any child over, let's say, 10. Um, the, there's physiological differences, first of all, between children and adults. So um, children are physically smaller, they have a smaller vocal tract, they have smaller uh, areas for the sound to resonate, so um, they have a higher fundamental frequency, so um, their vocal folds are moving quicker, so let's say about 300 hertz, so then a lot of the speech information is contained at multiples of that. Um, so. Uh, yeah, actually, in one of the experiments that they did in Birmingham, they not only tested for the different um, ages, but they actually downsampled the audio as well. So they found that if they went under 11 kilohertz, the word error rate skyrocketed because a lot of the information that you'd use to distinguish one sound from another is contained in some of the very high frequencies. So, um, yeah, that's, le that's less so for um, adults and because their fundamental frequencies are lower to begin with. But during the child, they are, gr they are growing, they are, the way they are thinking, the way they are talking, yes. and the frequency continue changing. How do you handle this challenge? Um, it's actually okay. Um, again, there is, they do change a lot over a very short period of time. So at an adult, as an adult, your voice will pretty much stay pretty stable over long periods. As a child, especially you know between four and ten, your voice is changing dramatically over the years. But um, Again, we're finding that the models that we build, um, you know, it's possible in the future we we'll make, may make a split again for very young children versus slightly older children. Um, but as well, actually, now that you mention it, um, the differences aren't even just acoustic differences, they're um, performance differences. So when a child is reading, for example, um, they tend to um, make more mistakes or hesitate a bit more. If they're talking off the cuff, they tend to do a lot of shouting and screaming and uh, laughing and joking, and uh, they use unpredictable words. And this is all, this is all a language modeling problem as well, like, uh, as well as a, an acoustic modeling problem. So, so yeah, lots of challenges. It seems possible could identify the ages through your voice frequency and other features, is that right? Um, could we identify the ages yeah. from the, t yeah, that's something we're actually working on, yeah. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no. Just a question, have all your improvements just come from your data capture or has there been any improvements in the algorithms that I've been using? Um, Is it just your test data that have driven the better results? The best with two things basically have been, have been driving our results. One is the data, so um, having good, reliable data, uh, well labeled, um, that has the more data we get in, the better our results, and it just keeps working that way. But as well as that, like we started off just using HMM models, and uh, we were getting okay results. And then we were trying to use um, deep neural nets to to train our data as well, and we weren't getting very good results from that. It wasn't making much improvement until we hit um, uh, an amount of data. So once we hit this huge amount of data, um, like about two, three hundred hours, uh, then the deep neural nets just kicked in and we got a massive, massive uh, performance boost by using them. So um, 
As I said, we're like you, using Caldi, the um, speech platform that we use, um, there are a couple of packages in there that we're working with, and there's a lot of parameters that you can use and change around. So um, we are kind of trying to keep up with the latest in the literature there. There's um, people from all over the world um, contributing to this all the time, and uh, they're releasing um, kind of upgrades to the, the neural net frameworks that we have. Uh, we're experimenting with one at the moment, and we expect that we're going to get some big boosts from that as well, and that would definitely be an al algorithmic change rather than a data-driven one. So, um, Would you have um, tested with children with language disabilities, like children who have stutters or stammers? Um, directly, um, we don't distinguish the data we have from those speakers, but we do have... Um, we do have data from speakers uh, like that. Um, also, the um, application of people who are actually creating apps and services for um, speech and language therapy, for uh, reading assistance, things like that. Um, it's definitely uh, an area where people could make, uh, make products that would apply in this area. Um, if you can recognize children saying things, you can use the answer that comes out of the speech recognizer to create any kind of um, app or service or, or product in this in this speech and language therapy space. So yeah, we're hoping that uh, we'll get a lot of applications in that area. Uh, you talked a lot about doing splits over your training set for young or older children. Couldn't you use something like reinforcement learning to tailor your application to a special speaker, a specific speaker? Could we use something like what? Reinforcement learning. Oh, we could. Yes, <laughs> we could indeed. Yeah. Um, we, have, we haven't yet, but uh, like, yeah, there's all these areas that uh, we're going to continue working on. So you haven't tried, it's not a problem about the architecture of the model that makes it impossible? Uh, no, not that I know of. But, uh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> um, good.